In Bitcoin, the communication between different nodes always begins with a handshake. The handshake process is something that is not really that unique to the Bitcoin protocol. It happens in many networking protocol. It's just a way for different nodes to recognize each other and to decide that they are going to work together. In our case, Alice starts the process by sending a version message to Bob. This message contains information about Alice's nodes, things like what protocols it supports, whether or not it is a light client or a full node, um, what is the IP address of the node, and so on. Bob receives this information, and if he wishes to work with Alice, he will send her back his own version message, which includes information about his own node, followed by a verification message that basically tells Alice that he wishes to work with her. Now Alice can read the information about Bob, and she can decide whether or not she wants to continue to work with Bob. Now it is important to understand that until this process is completed, no real communication can take place between those two nodes, between Alice and Bob. So in this video, we will look at this version message and you will see how we can construct it so that in later videos, we can actually send them in order to establish a communication with a remote node. I will start my code by importing the hashdb library because I already saw that this library is required in order to create the message header. And because every Bitcoin message has a header, we can expect to import this library whenever we are creating any type of a Bitcoin network message. Now we'll start working on my payload. And just as I did in the pink video, I will go to the table on bitcoin.org on the developer reference and I will just fill all of the proper fields one by one. Now the first field is the version field and this 4 bytes integer tells the remote machine what is the version of the peer-to-peer -peer protocol that we are familiar with. There is also a list of those protocols and their major changes and we can see that this list refers only to changes in the way that the peer-to-peer -peer protocol itself works. For example, here we can see uh, what or how an older client might expect to receive a different type of a ping message, uh, a bit different than the one that we have created in the previous video. But the one thing that is very important to understand is that these protocol numbers only deals with the way that the peer-to-peer -peer network itself works. I can use an older peer-to-peer -peer protocol and still be able to validate every piece of information. It has nothing to do with um, how forks works or with any type of other blockchain improvement. I'm going to use the latest version number. So in my code, let's just make a comment for the payload and we need to create the version field. It should be an integer. The latest version number is 70015, so 70015. And I'm going to convert it into bytes. It should be four byte long. It is little endian. And as we saw, it should be a signed integer. So signed equal to. Okay, so we got the first field. Next is the service field. This field tells the remote node what type of information and services it can expect from our node. There is also a list of possible services like to get UTXOs or full blocks. But in our case, we can't really provide any of those services yet. So I will just use the zero value. Now pay attention, even though it is a zero value, this zero should still be packed as an 8-byte um, little endian unsigned integer. The next field is the timestamp. Um, nothing too fancy here. We just let the remote node to know when this message was created. So I will import the time library and I will use 
the method um, time to get the Unix timestamp and now I need to pack it um, to bytes it is 8 byte long little endian and it is a signed integer so sign equals to So this is the timestamp field. The next six fields are related to each other. Basically, we provide information about the receiving machine and the transmitting machine. This is usually um, used to create more advanced setup, setups in which you can separate the inputs and the outputs. So out of those following six fields, the first three fields will provide information about the receiving node and the last three fields will provide a similar information, but this time about the transmitting node. I'm not planning to do any advanced uh, setups in this tutorial, so I will keep all of the fields in their default values. I'm going to start with the receiving field, and we can see that the first field is just to repeat the services field. So again, I'm just going to provide or tell the other machine what type of services it can expect from my machine, which is of course zero, none. So just as before, services should be equal to integer zero and it should be converted to bytes. It should be in little endian and unsigned. So signed equals false. Now for the IP address and the port number of my receiving node. In this example, I'm not going to do any fancy routing, so I'm going to use the default local host and the default Bitcoin port. For the IP address, um, the default IP is 127.0.0.1 and pay attention that it should be converted into characters using the ASCII table so I'm going to use the encode method UTF-8 and I need to convert it into hexadecimals and it also should be padded for a total of 16 bytes so I'm going to add another 7 zeros 0 zeros times 7 this is it next we got the port number and as I said earlier, I'm going to continue to use the default uh, Bitcoin port, which is 8333. So I'm going to take 8333 as an integer, of course, and I'm going to convert it into bytes. And pay attention, over here, it's supposed to be two bytes long, and the byte order is big, not little. This is one of those exceptions that we talked about earlier. This is one of those fields that required a big byte order, unlike the rest of the Bitcoin protocol, which usually uses little endians. So that was it for the receiving, now for the transmitting. And again, I'm going to use exactly the same arguments, the default arguments. So I can just copy paste uh, those three fields because my transmitting machine will again have exactly the same uh, arguments. Uh, of course, I need to change the name of those variables. But other than this, it will be exactly the same information. Whenever I send or transmit information for my node, it will be through the default ports and using my local host. Nothing uh, fancy about it. So that's it. Those six fields will tell the other machines whether we are going to use any type of fancy networking. In our case, it's going to be um, the default values. Now we reach the nonce field. Nonce is just an 8 byte long random number, just as we saw in the ping video. But this field, in this case at least, is an optional field. I can also keep it at zero. And the ID behind this field and the random value is to help me to recognize connections back to myself. This kind of weird connection might happen when I'm using a more advanced routing technique. But in this case, 
I can safely assume that such a connection won't happen, so I will leave this field at zero. And still, it is important, don't forget, we need to pack this field into an 8 byte long little ndn um, unsigned integer. So this is it, this is the nonce field. The next two fields are the user agent and the user agent bytes. If you look at websites like BitNodes, you can see that nodes have names or some sort of a general description. This is the user agent and you are free to change your node name as many times as you like. You can call it Bob's awesome node if you like. And if your connection is stable for long enough time, it might end up in BitNodes or any other website like this where everybody can see your name. Now because this name can change in size, the first few bytes will tell the remote machine how many bytes it should expect this name to have. But in this example, I am not going to insert any name. I want to keep this version message as simple as possible. So I'll give the user agent bytes field the value zero. Now you can either just give it the null value in bytes or you can just use the same method of packing a zero value. The result will be the same. And as you can see, if the user agent bytes equal to zero, there is no need to specify the user agent field and we can move on to the next item on our list. The next field is the starting height. This is where we tell the remote node what is the last block that we are aware of. That way it will be easier for them to guess what type of information we already have and what information it should send us. It is also very useful in cases in which our node can perform some services. The remote machine will most likely to choose to work only with the nodes that are the most up-to-date. In our case, in our light node, we don't have any blocks yet, so we start at zero, and don't forget, we need to pack it as a four byte long, little endian signed integer. Finally, we reached our final field, and this is the transaction relay field. And as the name suggests, it just tells others in the network that we are willing to relay transactions across the peer-to-peer -peer network. In our light node, we cannot rely on any transaction, so the remote node will know that it cannot expect us to help in distributing transaction information. Now this is just a simple boolean. We should set it to false. And the most simple way to do it is just to insert directly the false byte. Finally, we got all of the fields in our message payload, and now I'm just going to organize them um, into a single variable, so it will be easier for me to use them later on. So let's just make the uh, payload variable, and it's just all of those fields that we've already created. And the last thing we need to do is to create the message header for our version message. Now because all the headers have the same fields, I will just copy and paste the header that I created in the ping video. Just don't forget that we also need to change the variables to match this current version message. And this is it. Basically, this is our version message and we can send it to a remote node on the network in order to establish connection with that remote node. And in the next video, we will see exactly how this connection can be performed. And that's it. I hope you enjoyed. See you next time.